This is another exclusive rock music star interview. Conducted by Thomas S. Orwalk Jr. Welcome to episode number 39 of the Rock Interview Series. I'm Thomas Orwalk Jr. It is November 9th, 2021, and my guest for this feature is Rock and Roll Hall of Fame inductee John Lodge, bass player, vocalist, songwriter of the legendary classic rock band, The Moody Blues, and currently recording and touring as a solo artist. John Lodge will be releasing an incredible 10-track live record entitled The Royal Affair and After on December 3rd. This will be Lodge's second live solo release and features his outstanding backing band, the 10,000 Light Years Band. During this exclusive interview, Lodge talks about his new live release and also his recent single entitled In These Crazy Times, which he recorded in his makeshift home studio during the lockdown. In addition, Lodge reflects on his time in the Moody Blues from when he joined the band in 1966 and recorded the groundbreaking record Days of Future Past to the band's induction in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2018. So get ready. Here he is, John Lodge. Hey everyone, welcome to episode number 39 of the Rock Interview Series. And today we have the legendary John Lodge, the singer, bass player, songwriter of the Moody Blues with us today. John, how are you doing? Hey, it's almost uh, fine, thank you. Yeah, good. That's great. Um, John, one of the reasons that we're talking to you today is you have a brand new live record coming out on December 3rd called The Royal Affair and After, um, which is a 10-track live record that's coming out. Was this record something that you were planning to put out before the pandemic, or was this kind of like a result of the pandemic and not being able to do other things? No, I, we, I went on the tour with uh, Yes in 2019, uh, the Royal Affair tour with uh, Carl Palmer, another Birmingham buddy of mine, uh, and um, the amazing world of uh, Arthur Brown. And um, it was great to cross America, about 35 cities, I think. And when we were in Vegas, I recorded uh, the show, not for any other reason, just recorded it uh, for posterity, really. And then afterwards, that tour, I went on tour on my own with my own band to, to keep the mood blues music alive, really. And... Um, so I put in the show, uh, obviously, Sunset from Mike Pinder, Legend of a Mind from Ray Thomas, uh, Nights in White Satin, and I got John Davison uh, to sing a version, his version of that. A fantastic job, fantastic. And I asked Graham Edge to uh, uh, record the poetry from Days of Future Past because... Uh, although Graham wrote the poetry, uh, he never ever recorded it. So uh, uh, Graham recorded that. So on the on my tour, I was doing a lot of Moody Blues music, and when I listened to it after recording, I thought, oh, that could be good. And we talked about it, and the pandem- pandemic hit, and uh, I just decided. Uh, to carry on with other things. I uh, wrote uh, more songs. I released a, a couple of singles th- through the pandemic. But um, the beginning of this, of this year, I started to put the uh, album together. Uh, and I realized it would be great to release uh, the album to uh, really show what, probably what I'm doing on stage now. Uh, it's a different lineup for the mo- from the Moody's because we featured a flute in the Moody's and uh, I wanted to recreate the same parts, but do it on cello. And that's what uh, I've been doing, you know. Uh, I've got a fantastic cellist from Detroit called Jason Charbonneau. And, uh, it really seems to work as a live concert. And I was excited about, ah, okay, this this is what I'm doing now. And um, I'd like everyone uh, to hear it. 
Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you, I, I did go to see the Royal Affair tour in uh, Lewiston, New York. Um, and it was a great tour. And, and you especially in my review that I wrote of, of the show, I said that your band was the highlight of the evening. And that's not a knock on the other bands. It's just that you guys had everybody in the zone. I mean, you, everybody was familiar with the songs. Your band is incredible. Duffy King on guitar has such a such a great tone, almost like a David Gilmore type. And it really adds a new element to the music. It, absolutely. That's what I love of Duffy. I'd say to you, you know, even like, uh, in the solo and the song I released last year, The Sun Will Shine, Duffy plays fantastic sly guitar on that song on the recording. And that's what he does on stage, you know. Uh, in in Is Life Strange, he adds a new dimension to, particular to the end of the song. Uh, it seems to take it out there. Uh, and I love that. Uh, I love that. Well, the first single that you're releasing uh, from this uh, live record is a song that's 54 years old called Ride My Seesaw, which um, the, the newer version, the song has really kind of evolved and kind of, you know, really stands the test of time. And uh, first of all, why did you just decide to release that song first as a single? And secondly, can you tell us a little bit about how you wrote the song? Yeah, um, I, I wrote the song on a, a Harmony Sovereign six-string guitar. Uh, if anyone knows what that, I don't think those guitars exist anymore. But I wrote the song on that uh, and we recorded it in, um, the Decca Studios uh, in London, uh, in West Hampstead. Um, that's how I wrote the song here you know, on the, uh, And it was a reflection of me uh, trying to be positive. Um, you, everything you learn at school and you come out of school and college, and you've got to adapt to uh, this real world you're now living in. And um, it's, it's really to tell people, um, you know, to keep the glass half full and not half empty. It may look the same when you look the, but it's a different attitude. Um, you know, half empty and right by sea. So with a, as that, you're going to have times when you go down and you're going to have times when you come up. But when you're really up, that that's, you shouldn't try to attain that all the while because it, it'll bring you down as well. So it's a, it's a balance and um, ride my seesaw. And why I, I wanted to do it because I've had a cello um, and, and, you know, a bass player and a drummer, that's the engine of a band it really is for me. And I wanted to put for 2021, 2022, I wanted to put more energy into the bottom end. And I've got a fantastic drummer, Billy Ashbrook, who was in, in sync and with Justin Timberlake and Jason Charbonneau on cello. And I think we got this engine going. So with Alan Huey putting all the orchestral parts on top and the harmonies, uh, and Duffy Bloom, the I tried to get a total panorama of a song, you know, try and visualize this song. Uh, so it's not only uh, music. Hopefully you can visualize what I'm trying to do with the song. Mm -hmm. well, one of the things that you did record during the pandemic was a song called uh, In These Crazy Times. Um, was that meant to be just a single, or is that going to be part of a, a full-length record that you have planning to come out? No, it, it, it was, it was, it wrote itself, actually, this song. Um, I came, I finished my tour March the 9th in Boston, and I came down to Na Naples to be my family, and my grandson was 12, going to be 12 years uh, birthday on March the 14th. And uh, March the 12th, we got closed down. You know, I never saw him for three months. Uh, so uh, I was in my um, uh, apartment here um, and with, uh, with just two guitars. And I thought, what am I going to do? For, uh, how long am I going to be locked down for? 
So I went on Amazon and Sweetwater and bought computers, keyboards, speakers, microphones, everything. And uh, I started just writing for myself. And uh, I wrote this song in these crazy times. And uh, I recorded it all for all the... Uh, I recorded it on Garage Band and the whole thing. Uh, in my little room here, uh, put a microphone in the wardrobe, uh, recorded the vocals in the wardrobe, um, and got my wife to sing back in vocals. She's never sung before. And my son, who, uh, who, who plays guitar, but not professionally, he doesn't want to do that, is in marketing. And I say, come on, you've got to play. And he played guitar on the song. And uh, John Davison joined me on some backing vocals as well. And uh, I sent it to my daughter, Emily, who looks after me, really manages me. And she said, Daddy, you've got to release this. I can't. I said, I can't. It's a garage band song. Um, and I sent it, sent it to my uh, engineer who works with me, uh, called Ray Nesbitt, and I say, Ray, listen to that. And he, he put it back together and sent it to me and said, John, it's a record. And so I released it with no other thought uh, than releasing that song. Just, just as a memento, I think, of that COVID first few months when everyone was scared stiff, paranoid, everything, you know? And uh, all the media was telling me, we're all going to die. And, uh, and I was trying to say, no, we're not. You know, no, we're not. Think positive, we'll get out of this. And uh, that one, it was, there was a song in, in these crazy times. And uh, where I, whatever I was thinking, everyone else was thinking as well. Yeah, that, that's definitely for sure on, on that one. Uh, you hit a home run with it. Um, now you are going to be going out on tour in uh, March of 2022 for three weeks. Are These are going to be your first dates playing live since last March 8th, 2020, right? Yeah, it'll be two years, uh, you know, and uh, I, I've never known this. I've played on stage since 15, you know. Um, fortunately, I've been recording and writing. Um, trying to keep the voice in shape and my uh, bass playing and guitar playing. And uh, so I'm looking forward to that. Um, I think in rehearsals, we, we will, will take some time uh, just to get back in the mode, not just for the musicians, but the, for the crew as well, uh, to get all that, all that equipment and what did we do last time? You know? mm -hmm. Do you have any plans at this point to do any uh, more dates after that? Like maybe in the summer, maybe like another tour like you did uh, in 2019, the Royal Affair Tour, anything like that, you know, planned? I, I, I would love to. Uh, it's just everybody, I think a lot of the agents and uh, artists are still a bit nervous about committing, uh, uh, but I would really like to do another uh, summer tour, um, even if it was Ro Ro Royal Affair number two, you know, but because uh, we had such a great time on that tour. Uh, the crew were fantastic, and yes, we're fantastic. Uh, not, mu not only musically, uh, but the whole tour was, you know, four hours of music is a long, long gig. Uh, and uh, you saw it. It was almost seamless from one artist to the next. And that was the crew. Fabulous. That I felt was one of the things that made the concert so unique was the fact that it was seamless. I mean, it was the first three acts were like right after. There was like hardly any break at all. And it, I thought it was great. Thank you. Yeah, we, we really worked hard on that, you know, uh, different setups and uh, the stage managers, they did a great job really good mm -hmm. 
I want to um, talk about some of the songs that are included on the live record. Uh, the second song that you put on the live record, uh, uh, Saved by the Music, was actually a uh, solo record or a record you did with Justin Hayward. in 75. Yeah, um, it, it, it was another part of me, me saying, you know, uh, uh, what is music? What is music to me? Um, and uh, uh, all the things that could go wrong you, with your life and everything. I always said my my guitar, my best bass was my best friend, uh, because when things were overpowering on me and you're feeling down, go into the room with my bass or guitar and somehow you come out of it. And I think it's when we're, we're listening, when, when you first put on a vinyl record as well uh, and you listen to the music, it takes you somewhere. And uh, I thought, yeah, this is saved by the music, you know. Uh, uh, everything, when you're swallowing your pride, when everything you think is great, maybe not, uh, and things may go wrong in your, your life, um, put a record on <laughs> and listen to, listen to the music. Yeah. The interesting thing about that particular release, like I said, was that it was uh, released during a time when the Moody Blues were in a hiatus from 1972 to 1978. What led to the band deciding to go on such a long hiatus when you had so much momentum going at that time? Well, when, when we started in 1966, there was five of us and a road manager. By 1974, we'd got a record company, a publishing company. We had a, a string of record shops through the south of England. We had two offices. And I remember going to, we always had a Christmas um, uh, dinner for everyone who worked for us. And I remember going to one, the last one, in fact, and I hardly knew anybody there. And I thought, what's going on? And uh, I think that's what happened. When we were first got together, we were talking to each other about different experiences. And I think by 1974, because we'd all lived the same life, basically, on the road and recorded, our conversations had dry, really dried up. And I think we didn't know it at the time, but when we call the album Southern Sojourn, Sojourn means to relax and sit down and tell stories because we, we talked about the Canterbury Towns. That's what they used to do of a Sunday. And when, oh, Sunday, the seventh day, seventh sojourn. And uh, it was storytelling, uh, seventh sojourn. But I think we realised that we'd come to the end of uh, our week at that time. And um, we just decided not to do anything uh, together, but we still had the record company threshold, and we still had the office, and we still had the people working in the main office, and uh, so we kept in touch with us each other all the while. But I want to still keep writing and recording, and so did Justin, and we just built a Westlake Audio Studio in London. I think it was the first one in Europe. And Mo the Moody Blues had never re recorded there. So Justin and I went in there and recorded the Blue Jays album. Yeah. And, and then you guys did get back together and you had quite a resurgence, especially like in the 80s. I remember seeing you guys on your videos on MTV quite a bit. Yeah, and we got to get back together, made an al al album called Octave. Uh, we never knew what really was going to happen there because for the first time ever, we recorded not in London, uh, we recorded Lo Los Angeles. And, um, and it be, became a successful album for us. And then we went back in London, uh, recorded a long distance Voyager album. Um, and that was really for me, the resurgence 
of the Moody Blues that put the energy really back in to a live recording band. Instead of being a recording band, this was a live recording band. So all the songs we we, we did on uh, recorded on Long Distance Forger, I think we did them all at one time on stage. So um, it's for me, that was a beginning of the, uh, you know, especially as it was punk period. <laughs> the Moody Blues released an album in the time of punk. One of the things that um, I find very unique about the Moody Blues is that your style has changed. Like, you know, over the years you've evolved. I mean, your, your first record, uh, you know, a lot of people say it was the very first progressive rock record. And then, you know, throughout the 70s, you're kind of like, you know, a, an arena rock band. And then in the 80s, you know, you kind of like change your style a little bit to remain relevant. Um, was that always like a, a band decision to do that? Or was there like one person that said, oh, we got to change our, the sound of the music? Or how did that come about? I, I just think it, 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 it would never, ever made uh, musical decisions like that. Um, whatever, whoever wrote the, wrote the song, when you, once you put the headphones in on the studio, it just sounded like us. Uh, it, 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 the, uh, probably the only difference was that in the early days we used a Mellotron and Seventh Sergeant we used a Mellotron and in the recording studio we re used uh, Mike uh, mastered this cham Chamberlain. Uh, but in the 80s, you know, all the uh, um, keyboards started turning up and we were uh, trying to find out how these keyboards would work with a Moody Blues sound instead of it being totally orchestral. How do we made it, make it more synth? Uh, and so that's the only thing we did. Uh, we kept the songs the same. If you strip the songs down and just play them on acoustic guitar or piano, then could have been from any time, really. How gratifying was it for you to finally be inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2018? Um, you know, um, coming from Britain, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame was much bigger, obviously, in America than for British mus musicians. And um, I was excited, of course, for the fans for voting for us, you know. It's, but it didn't really cross my mind how enormous it was till I was on stage uh, accepting the, the award. And uh, they asked me what I was going to say. Have, have you got your speech prepared? I said, well, I don't do that. I'm, I'm just going to say what I want to say, you know. Uh, and I went on stage and... Uh, while I was on there, I looked at the audience and realized all those people there that voted for us and the other inductees, and they put a lot of effort into that, and the people around the world watching it. And I realized this, was, this award was for the fans. they the ones that voted, not us. We just play the music. The fans voted for us, and I've realised the enormity of it. And it, when I realised that, that sent a, a shiver down my spine. And that's why I said on the night, you know, this is for everyone else in the world, not just for us. And, and on a personal thing for me as well, on the night when I was on stage, um, you know, coming from Birmingham, uh, you know, uh, working class council house in Birmingham after the war, playing out, playing uh, in bombed out buildings and all that. Suddenly, there's this John Lodge kid standing next to his idol, Buddy Holly. And I thought, I'm going to be in the Hall of Fame, standing shoulder to shoulder with Buddy Holly. How cool is that? And uh, that's brought a real inner 
smile to my face. And uh, I thought, yeah, that's it. That's what it means. Yeah, well, it was very, very well deserved. Uh, John, I want to thank you for your time. I just have one last question for you. And that is, um, I'm sure you get this question all the time, but do you think we'll ever see another Moody Blues record? Uh, I don't know. I, I really don't know. Um, the recording aspect of everything is so different today. Uh, I don't know. I really don't know. Uh, I know close. I always think positive. And, uh, and uh, until that comes about, um, I'm going to keep the Moody Blues music alive. Well, we, we all appreciate that. Thank you very much, John. And uh, again, thank you for your time. And hopefully we'll see you on tour. Thomas, thank you very much. You're welcome. We'll see you. Bye-bye.